All right, welcome back from lunch, everybody. Thanks for joining us again uh, for the last session for the fun training on modern Fortran basics. So uh, just a reminder with, that we've got the uh, Q&A document that uh, we're periodically dropping the link to that in the chat for when you want to ask questions and things, because uh, we'll frequently monitor that for questions. Um, but for now, let's uh, let's get started with part two of day two. Um, again, going back to the agenda, uh, we've covered compiler messages, modern declarations, modern control constructs, organizing things using modules and submodules. Uh, this morning we talked about derive types and then how to make Fortran go parallel. Um, this afternoon, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Fortran Package Manager and introduce uh, you guys to some of the ideas about unit testing and give some demonstrations and and uh, uh, some exposure to some unit testing frameworks. Um, but before we do that, uh, I wanted to make a quick announcement that there is another upcoming HPC tutorial, uh, the Intro to High Performance Parallel Distributed Computing using Chapel, UPC++, and Coarray Fortran. So if you want to get some more practice with parallel programming, uh, I highly encourage you to go and get registered for that additional free tutorial. Uh, I, uh, I know Damien Roussan is going to be giving the Coarray Fortran uh, portion of that 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 training. So, uh, and then uh, another one of the guys I work with uh, who helped develop UPC++, he's giving he's he's going to be giving that portion. Um, so those are those are all interesting languages and program parallel programming models. So uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, make sure you go give that uh, a chance. Uh, also, uh, we will be sending out a post-tutorial survey. Please give us feedback. Let us know how we did, what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, what would you like to see as more topics? What would you like us to spend more time on? What did you think we spent too much time on? All of those kinds of questions. Uh, we'll, we'll send out the, the link for that, uh, but you can also find it there in the slides. Uh, so next up, let's talk a little bit about the Fortran Package Manager. Uh, as of yesterday, we have a module for it available on Perlmutter, so you can just type module load FPM. Uh, but I'll, I'll demo that here in a, here in a minute. Um, but let's let's talk a little bit about the Fortran Package Manager. Uh, first of all, what problems does a package manager solve? How does FPM solve them? Uh, we'll do a live demo and then have time chance for you guys to play around with it, uh, see what you like about it. Uh, and then maybe answer some questions. Uh, I'll, I'll give a brief uh, kind of outline on what does the future development of the Fortran Package Manager look like, and then we'll have time, some time for questions. So what problems does a package manager solve? Uh, basically, it tries to answer these kinds of questions and give you a convenient way of solving these problems. First one is, if I want to depend on some library that's not that isn't the code that I'm writing, but but I want to make calls into it and make use of it, how do I manage the dependence on that external library? Uh, the other is, oftentimes the package manager for a programming language ends up being also its build system. So how can I build my project? How do I test my project? So Ideally, you should be writing some sort of unit testing or at the very least some, some integration tests, just some sort of automated testing. Uh, does the pack, can the package manager help with that? A lot of times it does, uh, and it does so in this case as well. How do I create a new project? If, uh, if you're new to a language or you want to start a new project in a language, package manager oftentimes will make that step very easy especially in like conforming to its conventions and things like that. Uh, also, how do I find available libraries? Like, I'm going to start some new project. I don't want to have to write every piece of code from scratch. Well, but where did, what, how do I find out what's available? Uh, what kind of things I could be making use of? Uh, Package Manager can help solve that problem as well. So how does FPM solve these problems? Well, for the dependency management side of things, it's really simple. Just 
specify the name of the dependency, where you want FPM to find it, and what version you need. It is as simple as in FPM's configuration file, you have this section, uh, square brackets dependencies. It is a TOML formatted file. TOML is a somewhat standardized uh, file format for configuration files. Um, but uh, so you give it the sell it. This section contains dependencies, name, uh, what's the what's the address to the Git repository for that library, and then there's a couple of different ways you can specify a specific version. I want to use that version. Um, how does what about building your your code? Uh, FPM build uh, it fetches all of the dependencies that you specified, goes and finds those for you, and downloads downloads the source code for you scans your source file, uh, and then figures out how to build everything in the proper order and link it all together for you. It does all of that automatically, so, so that you don't have to manually kind of specify what, what order do things need to be compiled in, in like a make file, and manually maintain that. FPM can handle that part for you. Uh, for testing, FPM supports an FPM test command. So by default, if it finds a main program in a folder called test, it'll compile and run that when you run the command fpm test. There's also options of how you can specify uh, additional tests that you'd like fpm to be able to run in the TOML file. Uh, what about a new project? Uh, fpm makes that pretty easy as well. There's just an, there's an fpm new command. You tell it the name of the project you want to create. And then optionally, a couple of things about what, what do you want in this project? Do you want it to have a main program so, you, so that you can run some program? Uh, or do you want some tests so, that, so it can kind of put a, a template test folder and program in there for you? And then do you, or, and or do you want the, some library code, right? Are, are you writing uh, a library or something that you might share? How does, uh, what about searching for packages? That's kind of in the works, coming soon thing. Uh, there, there is active development on an official registry for packages and uh, it's gonna be integrated with FPM. So there should be an FPM search command that will help you kind of go, go query that registry and see, you know, help, help just basic search command, search functionality in terms of helping you find out what packages what open source packages are available out there that you could, could be using. So let's take a look at a demo. So uh, as I said, uh, FPM is available on Perlmutter, so you should be able to just run module load FPM, and FPM is available, and we have version 0.9.0 .0 alpha. So first thing we're going to try out, uh, we need a new project so that we can play with it. So let's do an FPM new fun. We'll call our project fun because that's what we're doing. We're having fun. Uh, and I want an application, a library, and some tests. And so what it will do for us is it will create a new folder for our project. Uh, kind of create the scaffolding, the source app and test folders that we asked it for. And then uh, get some uh, settings from our Git configuration file, uh, and then initialize that that as a Git repository for us. So we can CD in there. And immediately, the first thing I can do is I can already go ahead and say FPM run. And it will compile the project and run it for us. And there's hello fun. Um, as soon as I can get get the file system to show me that folder again, that would be nice. Um, let me. Why are you not showing up? Okay, um, well, that's interesting.
Huh. Well, I guess we'll... Probably dirty refresh button. Is there a refresh button? Oh, there is a refresh button. There it goes. Thank you. All right. So FPM run just works. So it, it goes ahead and, and builds it for us automatically. Uh, anytime you do FPM run or FPM test or anything like that, uh, F, the, the build step is implied. But it's going to make sure that the project's up to date before it runs anything for you. Uh, so that's all implied, done automatically. So what did it do for us? Uh, it created a template TOML file for us. Tells us the name of the project, the version, uh, placeholder for an open source license. If you're going to release this as open source, you should pick one. Uh, grabbed uh, some information from the Git uh, config file. So my, my Git settings that have my name and email in it, uh, it just went and grabbed those from Git for me. Uh, the build section is optional, and these are the defaults. But it puts them there just kind of to help you know that they're there and you can change them. Uh, similarly for the install section and the Fortran section. So the, the Fortran section is a little bit interesting. The Some of the open source community kind of wants to move towards modern Fortran by default. And so these settings will turn on the compiler flags to turn off implicit typing and turn off implicit interfaces and assume that it's freeform source code. Uh, so by default. So if you're coming, if you're going to bring uh, some legacy code, some legacy project and try and convert it to using FPM, uh, you'll have to specify this section and turn some of those back off. Um, but the idea is that we're moving towards just assume that we're doing things correctly and save me so that I don't have to always be typing implicit none. And I can I can use dot F for Fortran and it, I don't have to write it in fixed format. But what else did it what else did it do for us? Well, it created a readme for a readme for our project. Uh, fun my new cool cool new project so you can go edit that and start writing description and documentation for your new project but the big thing that it does for us uh so we told it to create a program for us and it did it wrote a main program uh uses the module for the from the library that we told it we wanted uh, and calls the procedure in there so what does that look like I mean, it's just a simple kind of placeholder. Hey, there is a module, and the subroutine just says, hello, hello, new project. Um, so when we run it, we just see, hello, hello, fun. Um, but this is at least a, you know, up and running. You've gone from zero to hello world in a matter of seconds, right? Uh, and that is kind of a big selling point for modern languages these days is, how quickly can a newcomer to the language go from zero to hello world? And what, is that, what does that process look like? The, the Fortran package manager puts Fortran back on the map in terms of how quickly can I go from nothing to hello world? It's a handful of commands. Uh, and lastly, uh, we can run, it, it created a test, so we can run FPM test and it'll compile those tests and it just says put some tests in there. Yeah, it's just a it's just a program with a print statement. Put some tests in there, but you can start writing some test code here, and things will and FPM will know what to do with it. So uh, let me check my notes real quick on what was my next step. So we demoed that. I think we want to add a dependency. Yep. So the next thing we want to be able to do is a huge part of having a package manager is so it can manage your dependencies. So let's tell it we have some. Uh, so in the dependencies section, I'm going to make use of a, one of my open source libraries called the ISO varying string library. Basically, it's a, it's a helper wrapper for 
strings so that you can have arrays of varying length strings and and have them work kind of like the intrinsic character variables. Um, it's at gitlab.com, everything functional, ISO varying string dot git, and I believe I'm at version 3.0.4. So tag is a is a git thing. So I I release versions by putting git tags, and so then it knows hey that's that's the version that I'm supposed to check out because FPM uses Git to go fetch the dependency, and then I can just do that to, to, to it says check out that tag, and then that's the version that I'll be using. I can double check that that is, well, apparently that's not on the screen there. But anyway, uh, so that should work. So we should be able to do that. So we can add that to our list of dependencies. Let's make use of that. So let's say, use ISO varying string. Uh, it defines a derived type varying string and uh, overloads the intrinsic concatenation operator so that we can write a function like this. Function create reading. Uh, let's have it take a name and return a greeting. I uh, will say uh, character star tent name and return a varying string greeting. Uh, so greeting equals uh, Hello, name, exclamation point. And now that I see this, these are actually all characters, so I don't need that because the intrinsic concatenation operator works. What I do need is assignment. The intrinsic assignment has been overloaded as well, so we can take a character and assign it to a variable of type string, and that works. Uh, and then we'll also make that public function public, create greeting, go back to our main program and use create greeting. And we're going to say use ISO varying string only put line, which is effectively the print function or the, or the right it's effectively a write statement for varying strings. So put line, create greeting, fun. So we ought to be able to, so with, uh, once we've made those changes, the FPM run command now goes and fetches our dependency for us, checks out the version that I specified, and then compiles and runs the project. And so now we're, seeing the same functionality, but doing it a slightly different way. The next thing we might want to do is write a test for the new function that we just wrote. So let's do that. I'm going to make use of one of my, open, one of my other open source libraries, Veggies, which is a framework for writing unit tests. And it is at gitlab.com slash everything functional veggies. And it is in version 1.0.5, I think. That'll at least work. But we, you can always go double check what version, but uh, I think that one will at least work. So I'm actually going to get rid of that one. And now that I think about it, let me go grab where I've done this before. I think I've done this before. Samples. Maybe not. Um, yeah, we'll just, we'll do it live. Uh, 
Uh, so I'm actually going to delete that file, and we're going to make a new one. A uh, new file. Uh, reading test. So I'm going to make a module with that name, greeting test, use veggies, only I need the result type, test item type, um, assert equals, describe, and it. And I'm going to need my fun module and the create greeting function because that's what we're going to test. So uh, implicit none and private by default. Uh, the thing I'm going to need to make public is a function I'm going to write called test greeting. It is a function that takes no arguments and returns the tests. So type test item uh, tests. So the tests are describe create greeting it and that takes it takes an array of test items which I can create with the it function. The it function takes a string to describe what it is we're about to test. So it says hello. And the function that does that test, uh, check greeting. So this is this is kind of like just the, the ceremony, the boilerplate for how you use this framework. Uh, but uh, suffice to say, we're going to now write that function I just said we were going to have. Uh, the convention I usually use is just that the result is called result. And to not confuse my syntax highlighting, I append an underscore to it. Uh, but it is a function that takes no arguments and returns a value of type result and where we can create a result by doing an assertion. I'm going to say assert equals hello world when we call create greeting with world. So about as simple a test as you can get. Uh, I am going to need to download and compile and install a tool that I typically use called cart which can generate the main program to run my test suite for me. Um, so I can do git clone, uh, yes, gitlab.com slash everything functional slash cart. Um, it is also a Fortran package manager program. So I can CD into there, do FPM install. This will build that program and put it in a typical uh, location, which is your home directory dot local slash bin. So it's going to download the dependencies of that for me, compile the whole project, and copy the resulting executable as I said, to my home directories dot local slash bin. It is very com that's a very common place to start installing user packages or user programs. Uh, you should I recommend having that added to your path in your dot bash RC file or whatever, because um, that's a common place that that this will put stuff. Uh, so uh, and and it is in my path, so now I can say which cart and yeah, there it is. So go back to our fun program. And the way cart works is it asks you for where do you want to put the main program, and then what are all of the files you want it to look for tests in. So cart, I want to put it in test main.f90, and 
by convention, it says all of the all of the modules that end in underscore test and all of the functions in them that start with test underscore. It will assume that those are tests that it's supposed to gather up and run. So, uh, so running that command should put a, a dot main dot f90 that grabs that module and tests and puts it into the test suite that it's going to run. And so now we should be able to run fpm test and it will now go get veggies because it sees that we have that as a dependency now. Veggies also has a dependency, so it goes and grabs that as well. So it transitively goes, finds all the dependencies you need, compiles the test framework, and runs the test suite. So test that, create greeting, says hello, all passed. And a neat little trick with veggies is you can tell it to be verbose and it will tell you what it is it tested. Um, I forgot to mention the, the slight uh, idiosyncrasy here. Uh, the reason I put this dependency in a separate section called dev dependencies is users of your library won't typically need to, to depend on your test framework. I just need your library. I don't need all of the things that you're using just to test it. So the dev dependencies are are that break. Like if I list things in dev dependencies, my users don't need those. They only need the things that are listed in dependencies. So that gives you a place to like separate that out. Like this is just for testing purposes. This is the dependencies for my actual library. And so we have gone in a matter of five or 10 minutes, we've gone from nothing to a hello world example that has dependencies and a test suite in like five or 10 minutes. So, uh, I got it, okay, that was weird. I don't know why the recording stopped. Um, yeah, so assuming that the dependency repository needs to have compile instructions, it needs to be an FPM package. That's basically it. Uh, all of your dependencies have to be buildable by FPM. So that that's the constraint there. Um, the good news is there are a lot of them out there already. Um, how difficult is it to turn an existing package into an FPM one? Uh, usually, pretty straightforward. So there are some, you can tell it, I think, I think the, I think it's this one. You can tell it a uh, source folder or something. Here, let me, let me go look at the documentation. So FPM, fpm.fortran-lang.org. So I'll drop that in the chat real quick. If anybody else wants to go look at that, uh, that's where the documentation for FPM is. Uh, there's an install, there's some install, browse tutorials, how-to guides, references. I want, I want references because I want to go look at what does the, what is the manifest thing. The, the documentation calls it manifest, but it's, it's the fpm.toml file. Um, I want to see what are the things that I'm allowed to put in there. Um, library, so configuration of the library target. Um, is that, where's that in the targets? There we go. Uh, yeah, source there. So you can tell it, you can tell it where your source files are for the library. You can tell it where your execute, uh, Tell it any external things you want it to uh, look for for include files or .mod files or what have you. Um, you can tell it what are the names of your executables and what what files are they in. Right, so you can you can be specific. You say oh, only this executable needs this thing. Uh, so there's a there's a lot of options that you can specify 
in your configuration file for your project. So a lot of times it's as, it's as simple as put an fpm.toml file at the root of your project. Maybe tell it what the names of some of your folders are because maybe they don't follow the default convention. And then it just works. I, I've had that experience a handful of times of like, oh, well, this was really easy. Um, so yeah, it, it, it can be very easy to trans transition into an FPM package. I've had, I've had several people tell me when they found FPM, they converted to it and never looked back because it is so much better than CMake. <laughs> and, and if you've been manually maintaining make files, it's, it, it's way better than that. Um, so as an exercise, why doesn't everybody try and go create, uh, let's see. So there, there's, uh, the link to the official repository for FPM, uh, future development. We'll talk a little bit about, uh, there is a centralized registry in progress. It's, a, a beta version has been stood up and is under testing, uh, but it won't be too long until we make that the official version. Um, the compiler flags that it uses, it bases on the compiler you're using. So it looks at the name of the compiler you tell it. So you, you can use a, a different compiler. By default, it uses uh, G4Tran, but you could use, uh, for example, the Cray compiler uh, by saying compiler Cray FTN run. Uh, why does it not know that? The help for FPM is good. So, oh, I know what, because I did it in the wrong order. FPM run compiler, Cray FTN. Uh, so it's going to tell me, so this is telling FPN, I want you to use the Cray compiler. And it's going to look up the flags for that, although apparently it doesn't know what uh, the flag is for free. Uh, uh, no, it's the program thing again. Maybe. There we go. That works. So I can use the create, I can switch compilers really easily. And the, the build folder, it keeps them all separate. So you can be testing out with multiple compilers and not have to worry about making sure you delete the build folder because if you try and rebuild it with the wrong, no, it, it sandboxes all of that for you and keeps it all separate. So, uh, so you don't have to worry about trying to, you know, keep track of builds with different compilers and things. It, it takes care of that problem for you. Um, but the, let's see, yeah, it will tell you the compiler options that it's going to use. And for Cray FTN, it just doesn't use any, I guess. Um, if, if I leave it off, it uses G4 train by default and those are the flags that it uses by default. You can, there are a couple of profiles defined. The default one is debug. There is a release profile that has a set of flags that is typical for release builds. And you can see it's uh, got O3, Unreal Loops, a couple other things. Um, but if you want to use a different set of flags, you have to Uh, specify them yourself, right? And so now it's just going to use just that one, right? So now it used just that one. Oh, and then the, the settings for for a handful of other things. It's got uh, implicit none and implicit interface warnings. So uh, 
So if you want to use a different set of flags, you have to remember to put them on the command line when you run FPM. But there, there was a project a couple of years ago now to add user-defined profiles into the TOML file. And it's most of, most of the work is done. It just needs kind of a final push to get finished up and, and put into the actual code. Um, there's also been work on some meta packages. So if you're using MPI or you want to link in LAPAC or BLAS or something like that, uh, there are these meta packages that can be used to kind of in your TOML file say, I'm going to be using LAPAC. It should, it should use the system LAPAC, not try and go find LAPAC and compile it itself. Um, I think. Uh, use system install modules, uh, so you can tell it external modules, so, right? So, so if I have a use statement, it's gonna by default it goes, oh well, I better go find where that module is so I can compile it before this one, right? But this is how you tell it. Oh, actually, that's an external module. You don't have to build it. Um, let's see. I think it's in here somewhere. System install, specifying dependencies. Um, it's got to be documented somewhere, I assume. Well, I haven't, I haven't looked at that very closely. I, I assume it's in here somewhere, but I, I know you can specify the some things to put in the link command. And maybe it just hasn't made it into the documentation about the the meta packages yet, but uh, th those are those are being developed as well. So uh, so that's kind of the future development. What's what's in the the roadmap for where FPM is going? Uh, you can go to the website to learn more about FPM or the docs and all of that stuff. Um, so I'll give everybody a few minutes as an exercise to. Go try it out, uh, create a new project, see if you can add a dependency, see if you can, you know, get a hello world or, you know, play with a little bit and see if you can get a project to compile and run. And in the meantime, I will start looking at questions. Compatibility with Maison. Uh, so, so far, FPM hasn't really attempted compatibility with other package managers or build systems. There's thoughts and plans and ideas about, well, FPM knows all of your source files and dependencies. It ought to be able to generate a CMake file or a Maison file or a make file or what have you. But nobody's, nobody's gone and implemented that feature yet. There, there's there's been desire expressed. It's just we haven't gotten to it yet.
All right, does anybody want more time to keep playing with FPM or should we go on to the next section? Show of hands for those that want to go ahead and move on. Got at least at least one or one or two go ahead. So I think we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is unit testing. So early in my career, I was a nuclear engineer working on safety related analysis software written in Fortran. So uh, and then got really involved in quality assurance and software quality assurance. So I got a lot of experience around what kinds of requirements are there for like testing software and how do you make sure that you don't have bugs that are going to give you wrong results that you don't catch. Uh, and unit testing is a critical way that you can help find bugs earlier make it easier to identify where they're coming from and fix them and help prevent future bugs from being reintroduced. So let's talk a little bit about unit testing, why it's important, uh, how you can do it well, and, and what are some of the techniques and, and things for that. So uh, this kind of is taken from a talk I gave a couple of years ago at Fortran Con, um, where I, I titled the talk, Your Requirement Specification as an Executable Test Suite. Um, basically, the idea is you should be able to write the requirements for your software in a sufficiently formal way that the computer can verify it for you. That's kind of the idea. So what, to start off with, what are software tests? Well, I mean, at the simplest, at its simplest, it's what well, we just kind of poke around at the code, see what it does, and see if it matches our expectations. Is this what we wanted it to do? So that's, that'd be termed manual testing or exploratory testing or something along those lines. Um, and everybody who's ever written code has written code this way, where I just wrote some code, and then I ran it, and I saw what it did, and that's the only testing I ever did, right? Which is, uh, I ran my program, fed it some inputs, saw what its outputs were, and moved on from there. What about automated tests? So automated tests are when you get the computer to run the tests for you and say, do my tests pass or fail? If quick, you're able to get much quicker feedback in terms of, like, there's a button I can push, and it gives me a red light or a green light of like these tests pass, these tests fail. So I have a, an idea of what about my program is working and what's not. Ideally, they get you get something slightly more informative than a series of red and green lights. But at it, at its core, it's just I have a way of having the computer run my test suite. But then what makes for a good test? Uh, there, I, I break tests into two categories, behavior tests and property tests. Behavior tests are usually easier to come up with and identify, like what should the behavior of this piece of code be? But property tests are really kind of the gold standard in terms of like, I'm defining a property of the code that should hold for all possible inputs or something like that. So for a, a behavior test, it's something like um, I, I called this subroutine and it launched the missiles, or uh, I, I, called, uh, I called this interpolation function with this data table and told it to interpolate to this point. Well, it better have gotten the the answer that I expected if I'd like worked it out on on paper or something like that, right? So like 
like I, I know what the answer is supposed to be, so I, I make sure that the, the answer I get when I feed it the, the right inputs, I get the expected outputs. Uh, Property-based tests hold for any valid input. And so you can say something along the lines of, for any two integers a, b, and c, when I add them together, the order, the, the associativity, it doesn't matter, right? So I, I can do a plus b and then plus c, or I can do a plus b plus c, right? Associativity holds for addition of integers. No matter what values of a, b, and c I give, right? So coming up with and identifying these kind of important properties of your code can be trickier, but they can really give you a lot more confidence that your code actually behaves as you expect. You can feed it like random inputs and go, oh, I didn't miss any weird edge cases. You can catch some subtle bugs that you wouldn't otherwise find. And then, and then it can give you a very clear, like, like shine a spotlight right on, oh, this is the thing, this is the bug that I have. This is, this is, this behavior doesn't hold when I thought it ought to. Um, so let's take a look at what, what would it be an example of something, something like this. Um, so for, for the examples that I'm showing, this comes from the t test suite for veggies. Um, so veggies is used to test veggies. It, it, it tests itself. Um, but so the, the test suite is written in veggies. You get the idea. Um, but the idea is, uh, I want to be able to write some sort of a specification that is formal enough that the computer can execute it. And I, I want that to be expressed in the test suite itself. Like I want it to read like a specification. And so Veggies was designed with that idea in mind. I want to be able to write a specification and then the computer can check it. So, what, so we have a handful of functions that let you kind of define your requirements. So given a passing test case, in what scenario, right? So, so this, is, this is kind of the outline for when, when you're trying to describe behavior-based tests. Uh, it's in what scenario, I do what thing, and expect what outcome. Uh, this is, there's also, there's a couple of different terminologies for this like basic structure, but the, I call them behavior tests. And it's, it's, it's this triple, in what scenario I do what thing and expect what outcome. So for this example, it's given a passing test case, when it is run, then it knows how many asserts there were. Right, so I want I want a test case to be able to to report back how many assertions were made in this test case, and so so the the kind of sequence of things that happen here is I'm creating an example input. What what are the inputs? So I'm creating an example passing test case and handing it to the test framework, and I'm giving it a procedure that it can use to do that when thing it's when this happens so this is kind of an advanced feature of, of the test framework but you you can write a a function that takes an input and returns a transformed input uh, and so it will take the the input you gave it pass it to this function and then take that and pass it on to the next thing right so this structure allows us to kind of like sequence together a, a, a sequence of events that the test framework can then run for us that says, what are the inputs? Then what sequence of calls, right? So I get the input and I, I do something with it. In this case, I run the example test case. And then I ask, what is the number of asserts? What, so this is where my, my output comes in, right? Uh, so, so this gets kind of threaded through, right? So the example test case goes to the run test function, which returns a thing, which then gets passed to this check function, right? So this check function is what is the test. So the framework will run the test with that given input that's been threaded through. Uh, and so in this case, the input comes from the run test function, and it's going to say, what are the outputs? Uh, I, I expect that I can tell 
how many assertions happened in that test case after I've run it. And so that's what this is testing. I'm, I'm making some sort of an assertion about what happened. And so that's kind of how you can organize behavior-based tests and describe them in veggies. But what about those property-based tests? Um, but there's something similar. You, the property-based test can usually be described a bit simpler. It's like a test collection can tell how many tests it has. So it's given any input or state, in this case, an example uh, collection of tests, I can ask it how many cases it has, and it knows. It, it always knows how many test cases it has. This one's a little, a little bit more toward, a, a little bit less towards the for all possible test cases because I, I, I need to know the answer in a, in ahead, ahead of time. But you could, you could write something along the lines of, you know, associativity or something. There, there are certain property-based tests that could be written for veggies, but th this is one that's kind of easy enough to follow. So given an example passing collection, I can ask it how many test cases it has, and it knows, it knows how many there are. Um, so let's kind of work through an example of why would you want to write these kinds of tests and why do you want to be able to, to get the right feedback and things like this? For, our for some theoretical project, I need to know whether a year is a leap year or not. It's a relatively simple function. Given a, an integer representing a year, uh, true or false, it is a leap year, right? Uh, so this is a simple implementation. However, there is a bug here. So if you've seen it, uh, don't ruin the surprise for everybody else, but there is a bug in this function. It might not be obvious to everybody, but there is a bug here. So let's see if we can write some tests that would tell us what this bug is. Because if this bug was buried deep in some large project, would you even necessarily notice depending on how complicated the project is and what it's doing, given some big, large input file and a big, large output file, how easy would it be to tell if this function had a bug based on the, the full set of inputs and outputs to some big program? Might not be quite so easy. The idea is by writing some unit tests, we can kind of narrow down the scope of, does this thing work the way I expected it to? First, we have to describe what is what is the expected behavior? So let's see what we can do to write down what the expected behavior is. If you're brand new to testing and you end up writing something like this, that's okay, but this is not necessarily the ideal, right? This is, well, somebody told me about this thing called unit testing. I'm just trying to play around and figure out how, how to even do something like that. Well, what, what kind of test should I write? What, what should I write as a test for is leap year? Uh, the, the naive approach would be, well, first I'm gonna describe the thing I'm testing and check that it works. Okay, I mean, yes, this is a test. It does actually execute the code and make some assertion about its, its result. So assert that one is not a leap year and assert that four is a leap year. I mean, okay, yeah, but one and four don't really look like meaningful real years. And we really haven't described what it works is. That's not all that much more helpful than saying that the function's name is leap year. Well, okay, but what does works mean? And I told you that function had a bug, but we didn't find it. Right, so that this test is, while, while it is a test, is not a particularly good test. So what is the next step? What, what could we do to improve this a little bit? This is slightly better. At least now we've kind of written a bit more description. Is leap year, is true for leap years, is false for non-leap years? Yeah, that was 
kind of a given. It's a function that returns true and false. And the name was kind of ind indicative of that. But at least we've kind of, now we've got realistic looking years. It reports what's the thing that we're actually testing uh, or what, what were the values that were actually used here. And we actually do catch the bug. Uh, is false for non-leap years expected to not be true? So 1900 returned true when it should have returned false. Okay, now we've identified that there is a bug. There's a case that we're handling it correctly, but why? Well, we can make an improvement to the test suite again to get a little bit better. What we really ought to do is describe what it means for a year to be a leap year. This is the tests, this is the, the description of our requirements that we really should write. Is leap year, is returns false for years that are not divisible by four. If a year is not divisible by four, it's not a leap year. Returns true for years that are divisible by four, but not by 100. If a year is divisible by four, but not 100, it is a leap year. Returns false for years that are divisible by 100, but not by 400. If a, if a year is divisible by 100, but not by 400, it's not a leap year. So even though it's divisible by four, if it's divisible by 100 and not 400, it's not a leap year. And then returns true for years that are divisible by 400, right? So now we've kind of, oh, this is the case that we're not handling correctly divisible by 100, but not by 400. That's the thing that we didn't capture. Now, with it, now that we've uh, specified our requirements clearly enough, now we can see the aspect of the code more clearly that, that is broken, that is not working, right? So if we go back here, you see, the only thing that we did was if it's divisible by four. We didn't deal with this, uh, this special divisible by 100, but not by 400 case. And now that aspect is clear. So now we know exactly, oh, that's the, that's the thing we need to go fix about that function. Uh, and then you can get a little bit more fancy about it. And at this point, I don't even have to show you what check leap year, check not leap year and check leap year do. You can kind of make assumptions about that. Uh, but I've given you the clear description, some examples about the inputs that are gonna be used to do that check all of the important information about my test suite is clearly delineated in one place and repeated by the framework. Um, the, the examples that I, that I use here, uh, the inspiration was taken from a talk by Kevin Hen Kevlin Henney. Um, to, I think he I think he titled that talk uh, structure and interpretation of test tests or something like that. Um, uh, I took a lot of my views on testing from the art of unit testing by Roy Oshrove. Uh, you can find the veggies source code at gitlab.com slash everything functional slash veggies and you can always reach out with questions and comments. Uh, so that's the end of the veggies talk. So let's, why don't we spend some time kind of playing with veggies, right? So we've got, we've got this uh, FPM project that we, that we had just created. Let's, let's play a little bit more with veggies. Um, Brad, yeah. there's a question in the Q and A yeah. about, yeah. about the, let's do that work on a multi-language software using C++, C, Fortran. The mains are created on C++, so we developed a lot of unit testing with Google tests. Is it possible to make veggies coexist with Google tests? Um, yes, they would probably be executed by different main programs. Um, if you transition to the project to using FPM, it, it's, it's easy. Uh, CMake, it's probably, you're probably using CMake and CTest if I had to guess, if you're using C++ and C, um, but that can be made to work as well. Uh, yeah, probably they, they, they could coexist, but 
they're probably not going to talk to each other, really, is my guess. Although maybe I'm not as familiar with Google tests. Um, OK. And now that I've thought a little bit about it, let's try an interesting exercise. Um, how many people have heard of FizzBuzz? Anybody? OK, it's a, I think the Wikipedia calls it a kid's game. Uh, where the idea is you're, you're trying to do it. It's a counting game. So you sit in a circle and you count from one to as high as you can go. But every everything that's divisible by three, you're supposed to say fizz. And everything that's divisible by five, you're supposed to say buzz. And if it's divisible by 15, you say fizz buzz. Right, so it goes one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, right? And if you get it wrong, then you lose, you're out of the game, or, you know, depending on what, a, what the rules you're playing by, that, that's, a, that's a loss or whatever. Um, and so the, the idea is, is it possible to write a program that plays fizz buzz? So the typical, typical exercise is, Write, write a program that prints the answers for FizzBuzz from 1 to 100. So it's generally a pretty straightforward program if you want to write it, just, just write it out. But it also can be useful as an exercise for uh, playing with a testing framework and doing what's called test-driven development, the idea where you write your tests before you write your code. Uh, which can sound somewhat revolutionary or unusual at first, but actually can be quite useful and helpful in terms of like, you, you think about the way you're going to use the code and then you implement the code in such a way that it is usable that way. It, it kind of helps you to think about designing code from the outside in instead of just banging out some implementation and then hoping that it works the way you initially thought maybe that was how it was supposed to work. It, it's a chance to give you some forethought. So let's write a new project, a new fizzbuzz, lib-app-test. So we get a new project. CD into there, FPM run, and says hello FizzBuzz. All right, so that's our that's our typical project like we expect. Um, what we would like to be able to do is do something like do I equal one to one hundred print FizzBuzz of I. That's the goal. That's what we'd like to be able to do. I'm working in the wrong main program. Don't see. There we go. All right. We, we want to be able to write code like that. So, well, we, we'd like to be able to do that kind of test-driven development style. So before I do anything to the main program, let's start writing a test suite for it. So there's our source that doesn't do anything at the moment, um, and our test program that we're going to replace. So new file. Fizz buzz test module fizz buzz test this is nine. 
private public test fizz buzz. So test function test fizz buzz. Use veggies test item t sent t scribe it. No, that's what we're gonna need. Um, oh, we should go fix our Tomo file. Dev dependencies. Uh, we'll just go grab that line from. The last time we used it. So test describe is buzz. It returns One for one. Check one. So we'll, we'll kind of like take this like one step at a time. So we want something like assert or. Uh, Result equal assert one for fizzbuzz of one. So we need a new statement for our fizzbuzz module. Yep. Um, we're going to have to rename that so that we can call our function fizzbuzz. Um, we need so. to also use assert in the Assert equals, and yep, assert equals, All right? So we, we better get the string one for fizzbuzz of one. Um, let's see, so we need, don't need uh, say hello, we need fizzbuzz. We need to change the module name to M, and then we... Function fizzbuzz. Well, let's let's let the compiler tell us what we're supposed to be doing here. Uh, is buzz m is buzz and we're just gonna print. hello uh, no tests to run that's right cart test main ninety test star there we go now there is uh, Function contained function has no implicit type. Right, so what should it be? Well, based on our test, it's supposed to take an integer and return a string. So integer intent in num character. I'm actually going to do this slightly differently that type varying string because this is going to make it easy for me to kind of cheat just a tiny bit. <laughs> um, fizz buzz. And uh, the assert equals works on comparing characters and varying strings. 
So fizz buzz equals one. But I need use ISO varying string, only varying string, and assignment. Okay. Uh, but I better go add that to my list of dependencies now. Which I can just take from before. There we go. So the question is, does that work? This is, this is the aspect of test-driven development that occasionally just irks people at first because, of course, that's not the right implementation for this. Um, oh, it does not. Um, module load PRP. Um, da -dum, da -dum. Um, occasionally, FPM will get a little bit confused. And at that point, you could just delete the whole build folder and it should work. Uh, so, re downloads all the dependencies for you. I think, I think in that case it was confused because the G Fortran it was using didn't match the G Fortran it was using when I switched modules, and it really only goes by the name of the executable when it's trying to determine what compiler is it. But like I said. Since FPM puts everything in the build folder, you can just delete it and start over, and it make, makes that part pretty easy. There we go. So now we're compiling. And test that, returns one for one, all passed. Right, I can even tell veggies to be verbose about it. And yeah, so so this is this is the aspect of test driven development that occasionally like people just go, wait a minute, you're doing what? The the rules for test driven development are I can only write a, a sufficient test to, to demonstrate that the code doesn't work. I can only write as much of a test as is necessary to demonstrate that the code doesn't work. Once And failure to compile is failure. Then I can only write enough code. I'm only allowed to write as much code as is necessary just to get the currently failing test to pass. If I want to write more code, I have to write more test. And then at some point, I'm allowed to start doing uh, refactoring. So it's, it, the, the typical explanation is it's this red-green refactor cycle. So you're allowed, you, you go, I, red is I create a failing test. Green is I write just enough code to make that failing test pass. And then at some point I'm allowed to between the red green cycles allowed to go, okay, well now I can now I can change this code with with sufficient confidence that if I break anything, my tests will fail. So having written the first test, that that was sufficient to make the first test pass. And so if I want to 
force if I want to go write the actual implementation, I have to go write another test. So the next test, it returns two for two, right? We'll just kind of go down the line, right? Uh, in this case, I'm going to break one of the golden rules of programming. Don't copy paste, but uh, do, as I, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, right, so now we've got a second test. Now what happens when we run the test? Check one. Oh, yep, this is why you don't copy paste. Now I get a test failure. Uh, returns one for one, still passes. Returns two for two, got two, expected two, but got one. Okay, so now, now I have to do something. And again, only a write, allowed to write as much code as is necessary to get the currently failing test to pass. If num is one, return one. If not, otherwise, return two. Right? It, this is where everybody goes, shakes their head and go, no, just write the thing. It's that simple. Right? But this is an exercise at, as trying to go through the process of take small steps and make sure you understand how you're going to use the code, what it's supposed to do, and make sure that you have tests that cover all of the expected behavior. Because if you don't do it that way, you'll have conditions in the code that you're writing that aren't tested. And untested code is untrusted code. All right. So the next one is it returns fizz for three. Function check three result. Type result. Result, result equals cert equals fizz for fizz buzz of three. All right, we've got a test. Let's see what it says when we run it. Uh, it's supposed to get fizz for three, but got two. Okay, yep, that's clearly wrong. So what should we do to fix it? Well, we can do, we can do this slightly more complicated thing because now we don't have just one case. We need multiple. Uh, so how about, oh, this looks like a select case to me. Case of one is buzz equals one. Case of two is buzz equal two. Case fault because this is the way you should always write select case statements is uh, with a default fizz. So is this wrong? Well, my test suite doesn't think so. So if I think it's wrong, I better write a test to prove that it's wrong. Four, 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 check, four, 
more. Buzz of four. There we go. All right. Yep, we fail again. Okay, so I should do and then case default is buzz equals four, right? This passes my tests, but this this is the point where all right, this this will pass my test. This is the point where I go, okay, now I, I really am just being silly. Um, but I really should write the more general test to kind of force this refactoring, which is uh, let's actually write the description of the requirements. Turns the numeral String for non divisible by three or five check numeral. Right. So what would that what would that test function look like? And, and this is the secret that uh, every every once in a while people do test driven development demos they they miss they they tell you you're allowed to refactor the code you're testing every once in a while they forget to tell you you're also allowed to refactor the code that's doing the testing right um, you are allowed to refactor your tests that test was gonna that that test suite was just gonna be a mess right of special cases. You're allowed to refactor your test suite. And when your test suite is starting to look silly, fix it. Start to explain what you're actually meaning here. Salt equals. So what is this test case going to look like? Well, I can actually go grab the individual asserts for the numer numeral numbers. So I can grab assert that 1 equals 1. And the veggies test suite, if you're going to do multiple assertions, you can combine them together with the AND operator. So I can do assert fizzbuzz of 1 equals 1, and assert that fizzbuzz of 2 equals 2, and assert fizzbuzz of 4 equals 4. And we can delete the functions that we don't need anymore. We're gonna, I'm going to leave that one there, even though we're not using it at the moment. What does our test suite look like now? Now we get, OK, this is a much more clean looking test suite. All right, so the next thing is oh, the the special case that we were about to look at returns fizz for numbers divisible by so the question at 15 is the correct output fizz buzz yes by three check three so we can just go ahead and reuse that 
uh, oh, I forgot a continuation character. Fortran, if you want to continue a statement on the next line, you have to end the line with the ampersand symbol. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the syntax there, that's, that's what that ampersand is for. Saying that this statement continues on the next line. All right, so we have refactored our test suite a little bit. It still passes though, so we're still not at a point where we really ought to go fix this. But now this is easy for us to add the, the situation that's going to cause the test to fail. Cert equals fizz or fizz buzz of six. All right. Yeah. Expected and got fizz, expected and expected fizz, but got four. So this is now failing. Now we really, there, there is no simple way to just do this correctly. It, it, otherwise, we're going to really make a mess, right? So what should we refactor this to? Here's where I'm going to go make use of another library I have available, which has a function that can turn integers into strings. Uh, but I better go add it to the dependencies. Um, it is also a dependency of veggies. So if I cat build dependencies veggies fpm.toml, I can grab from there. Right. So it's strings for Fortran, strff. So, so now we really are supposed to try and kind of write the actual logic here. If mod num three equals zero, then fizzbuzz equals fizz, else fizzbuzz equals two string of num. There we go. Now, our test should pass now. There we go. Now our tests are passing. All right, so we've got numerals and fizz. So now turns buzz for numbers divisible by five. Well, what's that gonna look like? Well, very similar to our check three function. Check five. Alt equals cert equals buzz fizz buzz of five. All right. All right. The one test that will demonstrate that it fails. And it does, in fact, fail because we got five, but we expected buzz. So the way we should add this, if we're, if we're being the minimal amount of code to get the test to pass, the way we ought to write it is if num equal five, And then that test will pass. 
but we know that's not the code that we really are intending to, to write. So we now can do the additional test should be buzz as well. Okay, yep, that didn't work, so now we actually do have to write the code correctly to get the right answer. Ah, but I still got it wrong. <laughs> because that is not the right way to have written it. Mod 5 equals zero. There we go. All right, and so this is, again, like being clear and writing sufficient tests really helps you get the code right without making silly mistakes. One last test case is it returns this buzz or numbers divisible by, by three and five. Right. So function check fifteen salt salt type salt. Salt equals cert equals is buzz for is buzz of fifteen. And so then that will fail. Because it expected fizz buzz, but it got buzz. So we add our if num equal fifteen, then is buzz equal is buzz and then that will pass but it shouldn't so then we'll write the next test hum -da -dum -da -dum. at some point There it goes. So that passes, but we know that that code's probably not correct. So we write one more test is buzz of 30 ought to be fizz buzz as well. And then that will fail meaning that we are supposed to write it the right way. There we go. Now we know that our fizzbuzz function is correct. Now we can go write our program that does what we want. Uh, because it's returning a varying string, I'll do it this way. Call put line of fizz buzz of i and do now fpm run, and we get the answers to fizz buzz from one to a hundred. All right. Questions. Anybody else got questions? Anything else you'd like to see a demonstration of? Um, additional examples you'd like to go look at? Um, I I have some examples if you want to start exploring some of the more advanced like or object oriented features we can start to look at some of those like 
how, how might you implement a stack? It's got test cases. Uh, how, how do you make a list that can hold on to things of different types? Um, so we've, we've, got, we've got some more things that we can go take a look at. It's just a matter of what, what anybody's interested in seeing. So I'm just going to give a reminder. There's been a reminder in chat, but I'll just figure, give it a reminder here as well that um, we have a post survey, a post tutorial survey that we encourage everybody to fill out if you have some time, because it's very helpful to ha get feedback. So, and you mm -hmm. can find a link. I'm sure everybody saw it earlier, but the link is in uh, one of the first slides of the day two, part two Google presentation slides. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, it's also added to the Google uh, Q and a Google Doc on the top. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yep. There it is. Right there at the top. Looks like we might have a question here in a second. Maybe. The test driven approach sounds very robust. Any cons or disadvantages or pitfalls to the test driven development? Um, it does take some discipline. The, the way I generally hear people talk about it is it, if they get decent at it and really diligent about it and then practice writing tests, they are almost always more productive. Like, like it seems like it would, you know, why am I spending all this time writing tests when I can just write the code? The experience has shown that if you don't write the tests first, the likelihood of bugs that are hard to find later is higher. So you end up in a situation where, like, oh, I, I wrote all this code, and now I think there's a bug, but I'm not sure where, and I didn't pay attention to making sure that I could write unit tests. So now a bunch of this code ended up coupled together and it takes a long time to try and debug or refactor in a way, in a way that I could actually write tests for it. Or the, 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 spent, the time spent up front in writing the tests ahead of time and thinking about testing from the get-go saves a lot of time later on in preventing bugs and making it easier to find them if they do happen to appear. Uh, the the cons is if you've got if you've got a team of people who are going to end up writing the kind of tests that we started with, like uh, you know we we were just do, going one right down the list of fizzbuzz for one should be one, fizzbuzz of two should be two, right? If you end up with a test suite like that that's not a very useful test suite, kind of like I explained when I was talking about, you know, the give, giving that presentation, right? So, so the downside is if you're not careful about it and not paying attention and reviewing each other's work, you could end up with a test suite that is kind of not all that useful. So there, the cons is that you have to do it right. And, and doing it right is sometimes hard. Still a bit vague about property testing. Um, I can I can actually do a quick demo uh, of that real quick. So let's let's add a test um, for the sake of expediency. I'm just going to throw it right in here. Addition is uh, associative. Um, have I written this example somewhere? Oh, I bet I have in the, the veggies tutorials. 
I bet there's something like this. So I, I do have a tutorial for veggies. Uh, so it has the examples. So yeah, add test. So we'll zoom in a little bit on that. Uh, so I have a test that addition is associative and three integer generator. So this is another advanced feature of veggies is that if you give it something that is a, a, an object that is of a type that is extended from a generator, it will use that to generate random inputs and feed them to your test. So it will hand your test case something that is of class input. In this case, I want to make sure it's a got three integers. I'm going to pull out A, B, and C for the, the three integers from that object and assert that A plus B plus C is the same as A plus B plus C. And uh, give a descriptive error message or a descriptive message to, to that test case. Um, so this is what a property test, pro property based test might look like. Um, you have to come up with some way of generating random inputs. Then the test suite is going to feed it uh, by default. I think it's a hundred random inputs from your generator and see if your test case passes every time. The tricky part is what if it fails? It's got who knows what is the input. How do I def decide if that that is what's meaningful about the way that that random input happened to fail? The, the trick is your generator also has to be able to do what's called shrink the inputs. Given an input that it generated, what would be a simpler input. So, so if we look at the generator for that, right? So let, we'll look at the derived type for three integer input real quick. It's just a simple derived type with a, uh, some, some components, right? Just something that extends from input so it can be passed as an argument to that function that takes class input and it just has those components so that we can package some information up to, to provide as an input. The generator then takes three random integers and puts them into that input and then wraps it up in a thing so that the test framework can handle it. Um, the ve veggies defines a handful of convenient functions for getting random intrinsic values like random integers, random real numbers, random character strings, etc. So get get some random integers and package them up into that input type. But if that test case happens to fail for some reason, we have to be able to take take back one of those inputs. Uh, you have to use select type uh, the advanced some of the, that's some of the advanced polymorphic stuff, but uh, grab those three values out of there. If they were all zero, well, I'm going to tell the I'm going to tell the test framework. Well, that's actually the very the absolute simplest that that this input input could possibly be. Say so I construct simplest value with that input. Otherwise, I'm going to do something like divide them all by two. Right. So I'm I'm getting simpler things. Right. So so that I can write something like an a property test. The, the property I want to test is that addition should be associative. So can I, can I write some test that given random things checks that property holds? Um, let's see, what do the stack tests look like? Yeah, this is, these are a kind of a mixture of behavior and property based. A new stack is empty. Right. 
and it has a depth of zero. But then for some property-based tests, given, given a new stack, when an item is pushed onto it, then it is no longer empty and it has a depth of one, right? So I could uh, push item, right? So this this is that uh, push. This is that when function. It would be possible to just push random things on here and this test would still pass. So in that sense, this is a property-based test of a stack. This is, this is the behavior of a stack. No matter what I'm putting into it or taking out of it, this is the behavior, right? So, but it, like I said, it takes a lot of practice to get good at identifying properties of your code and then writing tests for them. Could you share the code that you just wrote? Yep. Uh, oh, and the, yeah, so the FISBAs would be helpful. I will say that I also have an example, I think. Yeah, I went through this at one point. This was uh, an older version of the Veggies test framework. Uh, where I went through this example, so I can I can share this one as well. But uh, but yeah, I I will. So I, I wrote this code in the repository that's already sh that I've already shared with everybody. So I'll, I'll commit and push this code to there as well. Um, let's see. Would you say unit tests are a property are appropriate for your hold code base? Um, it kind of if it's like your whole program, there there are some properties, but but right, your whole program probably takes a long time to run, right? You you really do want to kind of narrow things down so it's like if this test case fails i i really have kind of narrowed down where am i going to find the bug like it's like, trying to find a bug in your whole program will take a while because i have to go through n number of lines but if i have a smaller subsection of the program oh well now i have to go through that small section of code and see okay there's a bug in here somewhere that said, you, what you, the, the gold standard is I have a suite of unit tests that really exercise all of the individual pieces of this program. And then I have a couple of kind of sanity check things that like I do run it from, from beginning to end, like put the whole program together and run the whole thing and make sure that things look sane. Like I, I've, put it, I've put the things... I put the individual pieces together correctly, but it, you probably don't want to write your unit your unit test from the, the the perspective of my whole program is the black box that I'm trying to write the the entire suite of unit tests for because your the combination of all of the valid inputs is so large that you won't be able to write all of the tests. That, that's what we're trying to be able to do is take take pieces so that the combination of all of the valid inputs for those pieces is smaller, test them in isolation. That way I don't have to, you know, if if my my input file takes a hundred different values, I don't want to have to test every possible combination of every possible valid input value for like the, the, the combinatorial explosion is just too big. I've been thinking, I think, test multiple times and measure the statistical uncertainty and make that a type of test. Small changes could lead to very large differences that might not be wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you're doing like Monte Carlo methods, that kind of thing, um, 
Yeah, if you if you're dealing with randomness, there are there are more advanced techniques that you'll want to use to test that code. The idea the idea there is you want to write your code as though it's using a random number generator, but then your tests actually give it something that is not generating random values, and you can make sure that it's using those correctly, because then, then you have a repeatable thing that you can, can check. But there, that's a really starting to get into advanced stuff there. Are there Fortran or general standards for commenting codes? The the explanation the exclamation point is the comment character in Fortran. So everything that follow anything that follows a an exclamation point is a comment. That said, there is a tool called Ford that a lot of Fortran programmers are getting uh, are uh, finding useful. I myself find it useful as well. In fact, if you go look at veggies, uh, it this is a Ford input file. Uh, so Ford will go parse all of the Fortran code for you and generate documentation. Uh, the documentation even includes a tutorial and kind of a higher level organizational overview, right? So, uh, and the way that that works is it looks in your source code for special, com specially formatted comments. I think I can probably find some, let's see. Maybe not. Anyway, uh, comments that start with two exclamation points are special, and Ford will grab those and put them into your automatically generated documentation. So that that's an option. And link link to their their repository. Thank you, whoever put the link there. Um, at this point, I think we are about out of time. If there are any burning last minute questions, feel free to unmute and ask. But other than that, I think we will call it a day. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Very